So, uh, okay, let's see. Do we have the gallery view here? Uh, you want to do that? Large gallery. Can I get everybody? Oh, look at that. <clears throat> Very well. So, I can start. Uh, what do I do? I press record. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, so we're online. Very good. Then I'd like to start immediately. I, uh, this is the second lecture in economic engineering. We're being recorded here and we're going live on YouTube. Live? Not sure it's live. Um, so I have now, because of the arrival of this phenomenal smart board, I've decided to take a little experiment and do a combination of slides and uh, um, uh, annotations. So. Today, what I want to do is uh, I want to finish off our introductory lecture. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, energy, power, what its economic uh, analogs in. Then probably I'll take a short break, and then a longer hour where we'll dive really deep into the uh, analogs between Luther's laws of motion and uh, the economic law of uh, demand. Um, Let's get going. So last time we were talking, uh, we did this overview, and uh, we looked at what an, uh, a mass was, an economic mass, and all these things. And I sketched out a little system here, and uh, the idea here is that you'll be able to look at such a system, and of course you'll know what, the, um, uh, what it will do. It will start vibrating and it will damp at the same time. You'll see there are two dampers, one on the spring. So this damper on the spring, it will reduce the amount of compression and extension that the spring will, use, will do. This damper here will reduce the momentum on the mass. So if you leave it out, the momentum will have its own mass. The mass will have its own momentum. Here it will reduce the momentum so it won't oscillate. Um, here is the bond graph. Uh, you'll see the mass belongs to an I element, the spring, a C element, and then there are the two dampers, one connected to the mass and one connected to the, uh, the spring. Oh, my God. This is wrong. It should be this. Thank you. I was a little bit too quick for the cut and paste thing. Uh, all of you should know this, unless you've studied economics instead of engineering. And you should also be able to make an equivalent uh, uh, circuit to go with this. Now, how would you read this in, uh, in economics? Now, that's what we talked about last time. We would th what does a mass do intuitively? Well, a mass intuitively, when it has a certain velocity, it will keep that velocity. It will take effort or a force to make it change its velocity. Now, in economics, let me say this. In electrodynamics, what does a, an inductor do? Well, an inductor is one of these things and it looks like this, and there's a current going through it. And what does this thing do? Well, there's a magnetic field that establishes itself. And what it will do, it will tend to maintain that current. It will be hard to change that current. You will need an effort, in this case, an electromotive force in order to do it. Okay, so the notion of force is equivalent here. What is here, the regular force, Motive force, as Newton called it, here is the electromotive force. Now think of the economics of demand. Suppose there is a demand for a certain commodity, apples or pork bellies, I don't care, right? So the market is just putting through so many barrels of oil or so many apples. That phenomena is called demand. We would say there is demand for apples. And it will take some kind of economic force to change that. Somebody's going to want those apples a little bit more, or actually desire it a little bit less. In that case, you know, the, uh, the um, demand will change, and the quantity demanded, the amount of apples will indeed change, right? 
So you can see that intuitively, as a mass maintains a velocity, as an inductor maintains a current, the phenomenon of demand uh, maintains a flow of goods or commodities. This is the instinctive analog, okay? So if you have some economic system and you want to know where's the demand, here's some demand going on, okay, boom, put it there. Supply is the same thing. It's just the direction that you change, all right? Okay, now let's go to the spring. What is the spring? Well, what does the spring do? It, 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 it kind of remembers a, the, how much it's compressed and extended. And the way it does that, it gives you a signal telling you how much force you have to apply on it. And it will know when it's relaxed. And that's when the force is zero. So the mass will never be able to register where it is. I mean, Newton's laws that govern this thing are the same wherever you are in space. I can take an experimental apparatus over here and just move it over there and uh, you know, nothing will change. But if it's attached to a spring, I cannot just move it over there. The spring will be pulling at it, okay? Now, what does a capacitor do? It does the same thing. So if you add a capacitor to this, uh, I think I'll, I'll, they're in series here, so I'll do it like this. I'll put them in series. So what it's going to do is the amount of current here will, uh, will not be the same anymore because some of the current will be stored as charge in this capacitor. Right? So the capacitor, the, the inductor has no idea how much charge it pushed through or whatever. Okay? It's like a mass. It just keeps going. Right? The capacitor, however, does. As the current goes in there, it's charged in this capacitor. Okay? Now, in economics, so well, this will be demand. That's described by the theory of storage. So you're asking for all these apples, and you're just consuming them, and you're putting, out, uh, putting them away, or you're just buying them and selling them at the same time. You have to admit somebody, I think. Oh, we didn't. If you're buying them and selling them at the same time, you just have an inertia. It just keeps going, okay? However, if you add storage to this, the situation is quite different. You're going to buy these apples, and you're going to put them on your shelf, and at a certain point, you're going to notice you've got a hell of a lot of apples there, and you're going to, you know, you're going to change the amount that you're demanding here. Same way, this inductor is going to notice there's a lot of charge on here, so it can just uh, take it from the capacitor and it won't uh, extract it from the supply anymore. All right? So the mass represents demand, this represents the storage, and these represent various types of losses. Now, what does this damper do? It will just reduce this, uh, uh, the velocity of this mass. What is that velocity? Well, that's the quantity demanded. So this damper will reduce the amount of uh, quantity demanded, and hence the price will drop. So it works at the discounting or depreciating matter. It depreciates the price. This one here, what happens is, if you want to compress the spring, part of this movement that your mass will make you know, will be absorbed by this damper and will be lost forever. Nobody will know how much this damper is being compressed. Some part will go in the spring, and that part you will be able to measure by putting, uh, by figuring out a moment later what's the force over the spring. All right? So this one will correspond to depreciation, and this guy to what they will call depletion. But all of them, Form some for, are some form of friction, economic friction. So that corresponds quite nicely to what we would uh, consider uh, mechanical friction or what you would call resistance in, um, in electrical engineering. So you can look at this. Uh, now, don't worry too much if you don't, can, cannot read off the bond graph. The reason I, I, I like them is because if you make a system like this, yeah, if you're a mechanical engineer, you can start a sort of translating your head, 
what, uh, what this is supposed to say economically. But if you're an electrical engineer, you will need an electrical diagram with maybe a resistor here or another one over here. I don't know how you do it. Huh? I'm not an electrical engineer. These bond graphs are domain neutral. And that's why I really like them. There's another reason I like them is because they show you how the energy will flow, and we'll get to that. Now, all of this we'll, we'll uh, go through in, uh, in hideous detail in the course, all right? So this thing could represent the little market, you know? There's some demand going on. There are some market players who have storage. You know? So some commodity market, there's some storage. Now, the price may be higher than you would expect it to be in equilibrium or lower. So the market could be, as the future traders call it, in contango or in backwardation. Then they'll have costs of storage, they'll be over here. Then there are some costs associated with the, 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 the flow, which will be transportation costs and other things. You can put that over here. There'll be some reference uh, costs, that's the, the wall. And you can talk your way all the way through it, all right? And that's what you will learn how to do uh, precisely. It's uh, worth your while. But I just wanted to give you this idea. You can take a look at a second, uh, our second order system and recognize all these elements and just immediately see what's going on economically here. This is like the kind of simplest, non-trivial system. So the price, what will the price do? It will like fluctuate. Now there is some damping here, so it will probably start damping out like this. Or uh, if you give it a shock, or it may be overdamped, in which case you won't even see any fluctuations. So you'll see some price volatility here. You will see some dis discounting. But more than just a phenomenolo phenomenological thing, you can actually solve the differential equations. You can see how the price um, goes as a function of time. You can see how your the inventory levels go as a function of time. You can implement this on MATLAB or Simulink or whatever you want. And you can make these things hideously complicated and you can track everything. That's the power of this. And you can reason about it as if it's, a, as if it's a, just a mechanical system. All right, so in such a simple uh, system, there's an enormous amount of uh, very quite subtle theory that goes in there, not the least the theory that controls the movement of this mass, and these are called Newton's laws of motion. All right, so they're non-trivial. So we're gonna start there. And as a result, you have a whole bunch of um, uh, variables that we keep track of, and after four years of training, you guys, as mechanical engineers, you kind of have your, your head how these things go, but it takes a long time. So what I've done here is I've plotted this thing called the tetrahedron of straight. So it's a tetrahedron. And these are the states, the price and the stock. So that's the momentum and the position. And in this little diagram, you see all the variables that the theory combines, just a regular old uh, theory. So you'll see here a force, a velocity, the uh, displacement and the momentum. There's not that, mu that much more. However, what makes it hard is they're all uh, related to each other. So as you know, uh, if you integrate the force over time, you can get momentum, and if you integrate the velocity over time, you get the position. And as you know, if you have momentum and you have an inertia, it will tell you how fast you're going. So that's this arrow. Huh? If you have some displacement and you want to check uh, how, what the force is, you know, it will tell you this as that arrow. All right? So they're really arrows. You can't go the other way around. This is the causal, causal arrow. And a resistor or a damper will be both. If you have a, a flow, a velocity, it will tell you what the force is over your damper, and vice versa. So they're all connected. Now, these same connections you can make in the economic uh, interpretation. So this is a one, this is an economic force. So this you measure in euros, or I use this generic dollar sign, per uh, apple per, per, per day or 
across the day here. It's kind of ridiculous to look at this idea. And you integrate this want, and what do you get? Well, the, the, the days fall out, and you'll get a price, right? So, so many euros per apple. That's this thing. Now, a demand and supply line, what does it do? You have here price, and here some kind of quantity demanded, and it will relate the two. And actually, they read it like this, interestingly, economists. So they look at the price, and they say, all right, what's the quantity you're willing to buy or sell at that price? So the causality goes this way. And uh, so this is the I element, right? And then the C element does the other thing. So you have an amount of stock, and you'll get what we call the convenience of having the stock. So if you, if you borrow a bicycle, you've got to pay somebody something. You know, now he's not going to just let you use that bicycle for nothing, right? Well, maybe he's a really nice guy, but somehow he's going to expect something. So you have to pay for the convenience of that bicycle. If you borrow shares on the open markets, you have to pay. You have to pay the dividends that the guy normally, the, 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 the owner, the holder of the stock normally accrues while he's holding it and all the other benefits, all right? So that's uh, this relationship here. And then the economic friction just affects everybody. So here you see, if you want, if you're an electrical engineer, just put magnetic flux here, you know, put the voltage over there, put the charge there, put the current there, and you've got the same thing. But this is a little bit the magic of this, okay? So how is this possible, you know, now? And I don't know. It just seems to work, you know? I mean, there's some philosophical issue about whether this is true or not, but is it really true that a current is like a velocity or a voltage is like a force? I mean, you know, nobody's ever seen a current, right? In fact, nobody's ever seen a force. You just feel the effects, you know? So it's not a question to ask whether this is true. The question as an engineer should ask, does it work? You know, do I get results that relate to something that's actually being seen and observed? Right? That's the real issue. So what, what Maxwell did here is analog for electrodynamics. This was what people found, is if you reason about electrical phenomena this way, you, and you start measuring what you get, and you start building stuff, it's just going to do what you expect it to do. So, is it that wrong? Is it that right? You know? You know. And this is the attitude you should take as an economic engineer. So, yes, economists may look at this differently or use different units, you know. Uh, I don't even think they really think very much about what the units of a want are or what the derivative of a price is. Is they really not? This is all to do the dynamics, and they really. They don't worry much about dynamics. Most of what they do is equilibrium situations. And they don't see a force as a driver of the dynamics in any systematic fashion, only in a sort of feeling, OK? But we see it, and we follow Newton to do so. The force, you know, gets defined very carefully so that it becomes officially the only driver of everything. And why? Because the force is related to the price, and the price is the thing we observe, right? What else do we observe? You can talk to a person and say, what do you really want? Ah, he can make up all kinds of stories. But what will be an operational definition? And in the philosophy of science, the operational definition is something that is operational that you can use, that you can measure. Well, the only thing is, does he change his price? Does he up his price? Does he bid it up because he wants it more? Does he go to the auction and says, OK, I'll pay this, I'll pay this. At a certain point, he doesn't want it anymore. And then, you know, somebody else may do, and they bid him out of uh, the auction, right? All right? So this wanting process is, translates to a business of bidding up the price. What is bidding up the price? That's changing the price. Now, if you do that in a real auction by the same time, for every moment that the bidding takes place, you know, you will see what the rate is of this price change. And this is precisely what we call PDOT, and that's the Newtonian force, okay? This is the key that makes everything work, and this is Newton's contribution. 
Before Newton, people just thought of force as an intuitive thing. You push or a pull around. You take a spring or you pull at it or you take your friend, you have a rope, you stop pulling, and who pulls faster? But what is the size? How do you calibrate it? What are the units? What is, what is any of this? We don't really know. We just know that you're either in equilibrium or one wins and bang, everybody falls on the ground. But how fast will they fall? You don't know any of that, right? Now, this is the step we make in economic engineering. You, you, sit, you sit there pulling each other because I want it, now you want it, now I want it, now I want it more. Okay, if I want it more, what's going to happen? Well, the price will go up. This will affect the flows, right, in the markets. That will affect what people are holding in stock, right, et cetera, et cetera. That will affect all these transporters and other ancillary services, and then the whole machine starts moving, all right? So Newton called this force the motive force. Um, Maxwell called a voltage or attention the electromotive force. It's like the motion, the, the motivation for a heavenly body or a bullet, a bullet to, to move, right? He thought of it in this way, the motive for it, the motivation. What we can see is this want is like a desire, which is a strong want, or a need, which is probably an infinitely big want. There's like a constraint force, right? That's the driver. That's the economotive force, if you want, all right? Okay, I think I have one more slide in the introduction. This was just kind of a summary. And uh, the reason I do it this way, I really wanna, before we get and we define everything, I just want to, to, to set the stage that you think about an economic force the right way, okay? As a want. All right. This is the tetrahedron of state. All right, so now I want to make a last slide in this uh, introductory, in the introduction part and just introduce you to this notion of uh, economic surplus. Now, I mean, let me first give a, I'm not a historian, but I want to, before I dive into uh, what this is saying and how it relates to power in an intuitive way, I want to say something more historic. Like, Mechanical energy wasn't such a big deal until like the 19th century or the end of the 18th century. What happened then? There was a guy called James Watt, and he was able to generate mechanical energy from burning stuff. And he called it a steam engine, all right? It changed everything. Before James Watt, the only way you could make their stuff was using human labor, and if you were not strong enough, you used more human labor, and if you were not strong enough, you used a horse or an oxen or something like that, another animal, right? So the animus was also another word they had for a force, all right? It was something that came from an animal. And James Watt, he developed this idea of force coming from something else, and uh, coming from nature itself in some seemingly, it is of course not infinite, but seemingly infinite amount of power, which is just heat. You can take coal or, or, or wood and just burn it, and rather than just heat yourself, you can build this engine and out comes it, kachum, 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 comes all this, uh, all, this, all this energy you can use, right? But before you be slaving, you know, these ancient societies like the Romans, they were built on slave labor. They would go around and the legions would just conquer some territory, like the Slavic countries, like Yugoslavia, and conquer by guys and call them, okay, these are our slaves. I mean, that's where the word comes from. And this is what they powered it with. And in the Middle Ages, they use oxen, and, and, and knights would use horses, you know. So if you needed more power, you would use, use these animals. And that changed, okay? So the horse disappeared, slaves disappeared, everything disappeared, and welfare came. You had inexhaustible amounts of this energy, and that was mechanical energy. And all this was built this whole industrial revolution. Now, in order to sell his engine, James Watt had to find some way of explaining to people who had no idea about this stuff what it was worth. So what he did was he groped around and he says, all right, you know, my, uh, you know, some way of saying how great his machine was. He says it's 
100 horsepower, where you define the horsepower as the amount of yeah, work a horse could do per unit of time. All right, so he took an average horse and he kind of measured the force, uh, the, 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 how hard it could pull some load uh, that required a certain force of friction. Uh, it was just pulling, and then what velocity that horse could maintain. And he took that product, so this is the force, this is the velocity, and he called that a horsepower. And it's just an invention. Now, the name is not so great, power, because what's the difference between power and a force? And in Dutch, it's called vermogen, which is even weirder, right? Huh? So nobody really came up with a good name for it, you know? And... Uh, and so it is in economics. There's really no good name for it. But now let's look at what is really going on here in economics. Now, in economics, this is called economic surplus. And we'll talk in detail about that when I talk about the Newtonian setup. But again, I want to do a little bit of history. And I want to show you how uh, the notion of mechanical energy and the Industrial Revolution that came out of it and its importance is similar to the notion of economic surplus and the importance of this in the development of uh, humans as we stand here today, giving this lecture or listening to this lecture. Right. Now, economic surplus, there was a time uh, that there was no economic surplus. And it's approximately 12,000 years ago so the notion of economic surplus was invented ten, in 10,000 BC, so 10,000 before Christ. So we're about 2,000 after, so that's 10,000 years. And apparently before that, you had these types, and they would run around in small bands, and uh, historians call these hunter-gatherers. So uh, mostly the men, they would go around hunting, and they would try to get some animal and bring it back. And mostly the women would be gathering and berries and other things to complement the meal. And they would just get enough that they could eat, because what's the point of doing more? Because the, wheat, the, wheat, the meat will spoil, and the berries will just dry up, and you're just doing all this work for nothing. And they, they would just have to roam around and then sort out that they got their food. And then maybe they'll run into another tribe, and they'll, they'll, there was a little punch-up, maybe, at the most, one man against another. And they would go, OK, sorry. huh? And then they will go each other's way. So it was a very different type of existence. There were no cities. There were no real factories or products. You know, there were no markets. Everybody lived, you know, worked just to maintain uh, yeah, themselves. And if they had a good day, then they ate, and then they just relaxed, you know. And then when they had a bad day, they'll be walking around nervously trying to get some food. And if it didn't work, a bunch of them will die. And, you know, now, and this is how it went on for thousands and thousands of years before that. And then 10,000 BC, in what is called the Fertile Crescent, which is now Iraq, there were some guys, and they figured out that if there was a particular, there, there was this river, the Euphrates, I believe it's called. And they, gr they grow these long grasses there. They just kind of grow in nature. And somebody figured out that if he shook that grass, then those little seeds came out, and he could grind it up and, 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 and warm it up with a fire, and then he could eat it as a sort of a cracker. And then somebody figured out that some grasses were better than others, and then they would reseed these, and they would get better and bigger, and then they developed wheat and, 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 and different types of grain. And they, then somebody figured out that this thing started rotting, so it started leavening and rising, and then you could like eat huge quantities of this stuff. And then they, they took just a little plot of land, there was so much around next to this riverbank, and they started planting this, and then they got this bumper crop. So they're eating, they're getting fat, and they're this, they can't eat anymore, right? And then what happens? There's more food that you can eat. That's called a surplus. Now, what do you do with a surplus? Well, yeah, I don't know. But you had a problem because these other guys, they were running around, and uh, they may have a bad time hunting, and they see you sitting on some huge pile of food, and they go, hey, I want this. So they just take it because they're used to taking anything. 
And you don't, you don't like that very much because you've been working very hard. So you uh, solve this problem. You say, hey, I have so much food. I'm just going to hire you guys. Instead of just stealing my stuff, I'll hire you guys. You become my police force and my army to protect me against other guys like that, right? So then war gets introduced. You know, and then you say, well, what am I going to do with the surplus? Well, I can hire some guys to make a pot for me. Or I can hire some guys to take some of this wool we get and make a nice clothes out of this. So it's pretty soon these people start like, making stuff, and then you want to trade it. So what do you do? You invent a marketplace. Now, this marketplace is very vulnerable, so it has to be protected. So you invent the prince uh, who sits there in the citadel. Huh? So he's a fortification, and he protects this. And uh, You have to all live together in this small area, so you can't just do whatever you like anymore. So you have a new code, and you call that civilization, and blah, 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 and the whole thing gets running. Now you have to uh, buy and sell a lot of things, and you sit there exchanging. You don't care to do that. So you invent this idea of money. Then you make some little clay tablets to be sure that when a transaction is done, you can see how much money is owed on this clay tablet. So they find enormous amounts of Sumerian clay tablets all about transactions. All right? So the whole thing goes nuts. And what is born civilization as we know it? All these products you have, and uh, people living in cities rather than and, and settling down on the land to produce the surplus, and everything changes. And economics is born. So it came out of only one thing, this idea of economic surplus. All right? All of uh, the importance of mechanical engineer came out, out, only out of one thing, this idea of mechanical energy, right, that you can get from nature. So I see these two developments as completely similar, all right? The mechanical energy came a little bit later, later but I feel we did a little better, better job modeling it, all right? And what we're doing now is take the way we control mechanical energy, and we're going to try to... Uh, uh, model, using that to model the economic surplus. So intuitively, what's the mechanical energy? That's not heat. You can turn mechanical energy into heat, but you can't turn heat into mechanical energy. You all know that from your course in thermodynamics. You can turn it into electrical energy. You can do with it whatever you want. What is economic surplus? That's food that you produce or value if you monetize it, or you can do income, or you can do with it what you want. You can, buy, you can buy ice cream cone, uh, you can put some lipstick on your face, or whatever you feel like. You can get the smartphone, huh? all things that are not absolutely necessary for survival, right? That exceed the actual real uh, cost to you. Right? So that's the idea. Right? So get, that's something. Like a want, this idea of energy and surplus is something you just got to put in your head, all right? The surplus is the available energy, we would say, sometimes called the exergy, all right? Exergy is very different than heat or something. It's not exergy. You can't do nothing with it, right? So we'll find other types of income, uh, but only... Those parts that are surplus are mechanical energy. Of course, it could also be electrical energy or magnetic energy, or, and we can divide it up in kinetic energy and potential. Now, this will be a topic on itself, but I did want to just sketch out how this goes. So we have two things. We have here the flow of goods, and here we have the what, right? That's the economic effort. What do you do when you multiply them? Well, actually, you can think of this in two ways. But, you know, there's this word fulfillment. Now, this filling, that has to do with this flow, right? So the idea of fulfilling is that you flow just to, uh, you flow, huh? You flow uh, uh, goods to you, it's just that you, this is like, an, this is, uh, You know, you want over a period of time, right? So there's a want here for fulfillment. Huh? You fulfill, no, sorry, you fulfill here your want. 
So the drive here is the DP. So the drive here will be your wants. So this is what I want. This is what I desire. So I'm going to search for fulfillment. All right? And the rate at which I do that, this is what I call economic power. I can turn it around. I can say, well, I, I, I will acquire all of this huh, in reaction to a want that I have. Huh? So this is the fulfillment of your wants, and this is the wants. Huh? This is, ful this is ful fulfilling your wants, and this is wanting fulfillment. There's a subtle difference. It just has to do with the causality. What comes first? Does your want come first? Then you're going to look for the uh, flow. Or just, do you say, no, the flow comes first. I want the stuff. All right, how much do I want it? Then I'll figure out how much I can get, right? Huh? It's the same. The causality is a little different. The one will belong to an I element, the other to a C element. It will be a different way of reasoning. But you can start, like a consumer may just say, hey, I need apples, right? I'm hungry. And goes to the Albert Hang and then finds out that they cost a heck of a lot. So uh, all of a sudden, they can only buy uh, one, you know? Huh? That's this guy. Huh? Or you can say, well, I, uh, I just have a lot of uh, things. I, I like liquor and everything, because I have a lot of stuff I like to do. So uh, let's start off with that, and then sort out how much I can get, uh, of it I can buy. Huh? This will be a, a typical, uh, what a company does. They're not really interested in the product. They just want to just want to flog the stuff. They just want to get rid of it, you know? And they're, uh, they're more focused on the price here, the wants, all right? In the end, it's all the same, you know? Because if you multiply this by dt or this by dt, the whole thing is, are you associating this with this or with that, all right? That's the causality. Right? So you have your dt, do you multiply it by e, or do you multiply it by f? That will tell you what you do in time, and that will give you the causality that you happen to be using. All right? But in either case, you're fulfilling a want. Now, there are several names for uh, surplus, and we have what is economic surplus. That's the one typically used, and an older one is economic rent. Um, the surplus is what you do with the buying and selling, so it's nice to think, uh, uh, we'll see about that, that it corresponds to kinetic energy. So that's the surplus you get from trading, buying or selling all the time, all right? Quick question. Yes. Why do you have the title of, your, of the slide, it says mechanical energy is as an analog to economic surplus, and then in a bullet point you have kinetic energy? Um, well, these are the two forms. These are the two forms of mechanical energy. Huh? Yeah, but also does that mean that economic rent is also a form of economic surplus? Yeah, so, you know, if you look at the literature, so the way I see it, the total mechanical energy, call that H, right? Yeah. Huh? Is the kinetic energy, call that T, so this is T, plus the potential energy, right? Huh? Yeah. So I like to think of this as the total surplus, okay? And there are just two names for it, the rent and the surplus. So some people call this the direct surplus, and this the indirect surplus. But how do we know when you're talking about economic surplus, if you mean mechanical energy or if you mean... Yeah, uh, that's a good point, and you don't really need know that, because... And I'll tell you the real answer to this. The problem you'll have when you set this up, and we'll see that, that the only thing that you can really define is kinetic energy, That's if, if you use Newton's laws. Because you know only what the momentum is, right? So you do this, and then you have the work energy principle, and you derive what this must be. So the way a, New, uh, a Newtonian guy would look at it is as the potential energy, just a form of kinetic energy, all right? Yes? I'm also not so sure about the uh, use. Uh, if I look at, then I find that it's uh, surplus, but then for labor. Also for land. Also for land, but those are all right. Uh, sure, so they're all kinetic. Yeah, so but then. Uh, economic rent is the thing that's stored in the sea element. 
Yeah, so nowadays that's often how it's used, that's true. So I'm not sure about it either, but let me just, let me just go a little bit ahead on our uh, lecture here. Okay, so the point is I agree with you. I'm not sure about it. I like to do it, but it, it, some of these concepts just don't really correspond. But one of the things that I want to talk about here, this graph here, can you guys see this? By the way, the slides are uh, in the thing. This is Marshall. Marshall is the inventor of all this supply and demand. Now, this is what you find in Wikipedia. This one I snagged out of Wikipedia. So this is, you can clearly see here that the kinetic energy is called the surplus, all right? Why? Because this is V, and you do a little DP, and you integrate it out, and there you are. We'll talk about this, okay? But here, the guy who invented it calls it rent. We would call this the cost, and he calls it expenses, okay? So, you know, huh? it's, uh, it's uh, just, I mean, Oza, your question is a good one, and I don't really know, right? Yeah? It's a little bit fuzzy. And when I get to this, I'll try, and when I get to the C element, I'll give you a little bit of my reasons, but I, I am willing to just forget about that. Huh? And, uh, But this is a good remark. I just, yeah, they seem to use both. And the old timers, they used rent, you know, now for land, labor, and those kind of things. But Marshall then used it for everything. And then later they switched to yeah, surplus. Yeah, but kinetic energy can also be surplus or rent, you see? Okay, huh? so not potential. With the potential energy, that's the stuff, that's the value of your uh, backlog or of your inventory. No, I know that you look at it that way. So, you know what I want to do? Let's just cross this out for the moment. And then we're going to get to this discussion of why I think so or why we should act, you know now? So I'll just call this also surplus. I call this direct. Huh? You can think of this also as, well, one, nice, one, one thing I do is I think of this as the economic profit. Actually, maybe I should have said that, okay? And you can think of this then as the economic rent and both of them uh, together as the uh, economic surplus. That would have been uh, maybe better. So this you can think of profit, yes, because at this flow, you'll have a price movement, DP, and it's kind of like a profit. It's just that we don't like to talk about profit and economics for consumers, but I don't see a problem with that either, because as a consumer, I say I really profit from uh, these low prices, you know? Huh? Uh, but yeah, so maybe it's uh, less, it, 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 I'm not, I'm not, uh, huh? So here you're calling it economic profit from a consumer's point of view. Yeah. Not from a manufacturer's point of view. Well, also for us, there's no difference, you see? You see, well, I'll, sh I'll show you that when we get to the point is they have to treat demand and supply as separate things because they don't have vectorial quantities. For them, price is a positive number, you know? But for us, momentum isn't. So we can, we can put the two together. It's just a question of sign, right? For them, the quantity demanded is also always a positive number, so they have to flip the axis around. But we will think of it as a vectorial quantity, and we'll see all these equations as vector equations, and they don't do that. Now, if you do that, then you can fix all these. You can, you can have somebody who buys and sells at the same time along the same demand curve, you see? And who are these people? Well, they're not consumers or producers, but they're traders. I mean. They buy uh, some apples and they sell it again. So they, they switch orientation, you know? You know? So it's like an I element that, that is connected to a C element. So a mass connected to a spring. And the spring, that's their storage of the apple. So he, Albert Hyde may be buying them, putting them in storage or on the shelf, and then selling them. And then when the shelf goes down, he will buy some more, you know, and then sell them. So he, like every mass spring system, it will go through an oscillatory cycle, right? 
Is he a buyer or a seller? Well, he's both buyer and seller of apples, right? Huh? We would call it a trader. So you could think of a producer at one end that just goes like this, but everybody in there is just vibrating and passing through some way, huh? like a beam that you give a hit to, you know, like a supply line. As uh, Ruma will be able to explain to us. Let's go on with the presentation yeah. for now. That's, uh, that's yeah, 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 yeah. It was more of a rhetorical thing. Huh? Okay. So, so, but you know, these are really good details. And I think, uh, let's just leave this for now. But what I think is good is, is to disagree with all this stuff because I've come up with names for this and I just haven't been doing any good. You know, it's like uh, I haven't found anything. And then I realize I don't even think power is good. You know, why would it be power in English and vermoge in Dutch? You know, like vermoge is something you own, you know, like, which is equity in English. Why, why is power not equity? You know, now it's just a little bit. Uh, so, an energy or f momentum, uh, you know. So you, you end up groping around a little bit. I, I, I was spending some time thinking what could be the analog of James Watt's horse. And uh, Adam Smith, he has uh, this idea of uh, what's sometimes called the labor theory of value. Uh, that's taken over by Marx and stuff, and therefore got discredited with the fall of communism. But the idea was that there was like a, a standard laborer in 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 his day. Most of uh, most of it came from labor, and he was like before the industrial revolution really took off. So this is what you measured, you know. And they were the ones who were seen inputting it. So you can think of a unit of standard labor of a standard laborer as being this equivalent of power, right? So he's able, this laborer is able to increase the price of the products at a, uh, at a particular rate at which the products are going through the factory, right? This is what he does. So he adds value, huh? increases how much other people would want it, huh? or responds to the wants of the consumer, and he's putting out so much. Huh? And that's at a unit of standard labor. And that, I was thinking, could be the equivalent, conceptually, of, of um, James Watt's horse. And there's something attractive to that idea, because it's from the same time, and a horse, you know, whatever a horse, right? Whatever a laborer. But some of this, I'm still groping around for good terms. OK. So that brings me to the second uh, part of my talk. So let me first just do this slide, and then we can take a short break, just to tell you what I'm uh, going to do here. So OK, so now uh, this was the overview. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do a deep dive in Newton's law. That's really only what we're going to do, really, is only this thing. And, uh, and this thing. There's a little bit of this, but mostly this thing here. Kind of ridiculous that you have to spend a lot of time on that, but uh, it's not ridiculous, you know. And uh, this thing was introduced by a fellow called uh, Isaac Newton, and he wrote a book. He spent his whole life writing this book. He figured this out, but he doubted himself so much. He was very insecure. And at a certain point, as you can see here, in 1686, he published uh, this thing. Uh, natural philosophy and the principles of mathematics. Right? The author is uh, I.S. Newton, Isaac Newton. He's at Trinity College in Cambridge. He's a Lucasian professor. Here he is. This is his book. Now, this book changed everything, huh? So, and um, one thing that, uh, for a book that changes everything, uh, what's surprising is that nobody's ever read it. So when people refer to Newton's law, none of these, or explain it, none of these people have ever read Newton. You can just read this thing. It's actually, I, I took the trouble of doing so. It's translated, and it's pretty good. You could just read it. Huh? It's really interesting. 
And you can see that he understands a lot better what he's doing than most of the people who haven't read it who are explaining what he is doing. You know? It's just a surprising aspect. I think I've only met one writer who actually read it and wrote a book, and that's Richard Feynman huh? in his lectures on physics. So if you ever want to read about this, I recommend Newton himself a little bit. And if you don't want to do that, go to Feynman, and he will, act, he will know what Newton says. He just says, Newton says this, and sure enough, okay? The rest, you know. So, you know, uh, you may learn stuff that what well, Newton's second law is, is this. No, he never said that, okay? He didn't say this. He said uh, this. He even didn't say this. He said this. If you read it. He didn't say it this way. I think, why? Because this denotation was invented by Leibniz around the same time. And one of the problems Newton had is he had to like develop all this physics, but there wasn't any math around to do so. So Newton developed something called calculus. All right, so this is, this is absolutely stunning. I mean, the guy comes up with a bunch of laws, and then he figures out that the math to do it doesn't exist, so he goes around and invents the math, too. I mean, when you, the more you read him, uh, the more you kind of get a little, uh, like, uh, how can this happen? You know, it's like, uh, makes no sense. Huh? That's a single person that could do such a thing. And, but Leibniz has his own idea. So, but Newton, he used these fluxions, and he didn't see it necessarily as, you know, dp, dt. He saw it as a quality on itself, and then he had notions for integrals. I think he put a box next to it or something. You know, this integral notation, that's also from Leibniz. Leibniz, uh, he put a big S there for some, summa, right? And then he had this for a differential. So what, what happened now is sort of a mixture of Newton's notation of fluxions with these dots. Uh, we junked his, uh, his, his boxes for integrals and Leibniz's notation here, all right? So some of this stuff is better written out in Leibniz's notation. I think it's it's quite good because it also gives the way to differential geometry and also the economic idea of doing something at the margin. Eh? So an economist will look at a margin and look at a small change, you know, and this differential uh, encapsulates that uh, thing. All right? So that's all in there. You can read it. And um, there are three parts to this that are relevant. He starts off with a bunch of definitions, and that's just stuff uh, that he knows, with spaces and what momentum is actually. And that's the first thing I'll talk about after the break, what he just writes down in his definitions. Then he has a scolium, and uh, I actually forgot what, uh, oh no, sorry. So, in his definitions, he brings momentum into place. That was there. The scolium, he talks about space and velocity, what that is. And then the, what he calls the axioms or the laws of motions, those are his three laws. So what we'll do after the break, we'll go through those parts of Newton's thing. And then, of course, focus on these axioms, the first, second, and third law, look at their economic equivalent, then derive... Uh, the idea of kinetic energy from it, an economic surplus, and then put it all together at the end in a little I element and show you how that uh, keeps track of it, okay? So with that, I'd like to take a short break now. I want to take, uh, yeah, no more than 10 minutes. So, uh, and then, uh, because we have a lot to do. So let's convene uh, around, uh, one, uh, one forty or so, or a little bit before it. Two forty, yeah. Uh, no, oh, that thing is a that thing is still on the old time, right? Huh? So, so here we are. Um, 
for the next, uh, the remaining part of this lecture, what I want to do is uh, go through Newton's book, the way Newton himself sets it up, and then carefully map the economic equivalent. I found this is the best. That's uh, unbelievable nice. And it's a fun thing to do, to go back to the old master. So I'm starting, you know, again, Newton divided this, this, this work into three sections. He had a definition, a scolium, and then the actions. We'll first start with what he does in the definition, then the scolium, uh, and then we'll, we'll dive into the laws itself. So in the definition, what he does, he introduces the notion of momentum. And that is known to every engineering um, student uh, in this form. Normally, this is how momentum is defined. So you, you say you have a mass, it has a certain velocity. If I multiply the two, I get something uh, called momentum. Now, this is always a little bit of a mystical quantity, and it always has been in the, um, the, um, uh, this, uh, the mechanical tradition, because there were other notions of momentum floating around. So there's a guy called Leibniz, and he felt that this was the right notion, m times v squared. Okay? Now, obviously, this reminds us more of the uh, kinetic energy if you would uh, be missing the half. All right? Then there was a guy called Descartes. You know him from Cartesian uh, coordinate frames. And he thought this was momentum. So you take the mass and you multiply it by the speed. Right? So his idea was that this is always a positive number. So this is also a positive number. So in the beginning, they, they were struggling because this momentum, the idea was that it would be some kind of measure of the quantity of the motion. So the velocity itself was not a quantity. You couldn't really think of it as something that was stored in the object as something that it had. You know, it was, you couldn't really add two velocities together and say, well, this object has now twice as much quantity of motion now, you know, because if it had more mass, they also felt that the amount of motion was uh, double. So it had to depend on both things. And they were just groping around, and they always felt it had to be a positive quantity. And Descartes had a theory that the quantity of motion, as he defined it, in the universe was, uh, uh, yeah, it was held uh, constant, or some theory, right? And Leibniz, he had this idea that this was constant, and he called it this quantity of motion. Uh, it's constant. They have some Latin terms for it. Quantitatis motus, and this is vis viva or something. And then comes along Huygens, and at least he resolves this issue. So Huygens notes that Descartes' definition won't work, because if he gets, if he has two uh, like equally sized billiard walls, and he has them crash together with a little bit of sticky tape, then obviously all the motion was gone. You know, in the beginning he had two things moving, and at the end he just has one thing moving and standing still. So how can this ever be conserved? So Huygens' solution was to say that if this ball is going this way, and this ball is going that way, and here they crash together, and then the velocity is zero, to say, well, this one has negative uh, momentum, this one has a positive amount, and the sum of these is zero before and after the uh, collision. All right? Similarly, with an explosion, then they're together, this thing is exploding, and it looks like all this motion comes from nowhere, but it really doesn't, it's still zero, just if you add up the sign motion of all the parts, it's just, it's a zero, it's still zero, all right? So this is the law of conservation of momentum. So what you needed to do, he says, Descartes, you have to get rid of this thing, right? And call it m times v. And he says, this won't work, because that squaring is just going to make everything positive, and you need positive and negative 
quality. So that's the big break. Huh? So this is this will work, and this we fix. And there we are. And that's where things stood when Newton, this discussion was going, and Newton was aware of it because Hodgkins would be writing to him or to the Royal Society. So uh, Newton realized that Hodgkins' idea was the right one. And he says, okay, that's how I'm gonna, I'm gonna take Hodgkins' definition of momentum. And I'll call that the quantity of motion. Right? Now, if you look at, now we know now from our introduction, this is here the price. This is the quantity demanded. I'll just call that the demand. And this is the relationship between the two. This is the elast price elasticity. So now I'll just uh, look at one of these schedules. Here's one. And uh, here's the price. I just plucked this from the internet. It was like the first one that just got the price of pizza in dollars per slice. This is a supply curve, so it goes nicely upward. So this slope here would be M. This would be the momentum. And this thing should be the velocity, right? The quantity demanded. Now notice this, you, I don't know if you can read this, but it says quantity of pizza in, in slices. In slices. I mean, this is where you go like as an engineer, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you really mean slices? This, this I can get. This is in, in dollars per, per, per slice. But this thing should be in slices per, per day or something, right? And if you press this economist, he will admit that. He will say, no, 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 you're right. And he will call it, it's a flow variable. It's not a stock, right? Huh? But they are very, very sloppy about this, OK? This is a more modern thing. This is an old timer. So uh, I got this also from the internet. But this one is a, uh, a little while ago, a little, uh, while ago huh? probably uh, at the beginning of last century. And here you see the guy is a little bit uh, uh, more precise. So here he has dollars per hundred weight or whatever of, 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 of bushels. And here he has consumption per day. So here he does it right. He changes the scale, millions of bushels, but whatever. How does that relate to it? But this is at least per day, right? So. When you start matching these demands and supply schedules with Huygens's definition of momentum, you gotta be careful, you know? Because economists are nuts, all right? In terms of unit. Now this is a big, big difference. And if you're an engineer and you, 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 you study here and you get the unit of force wrong, they just usher you out of the room. I mean, you failed and please go study something else, okay? But he, 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 economics works very differently. So that's not to say that it's bad, actually, because I've learned a lot from being more flexible on the units. But it's something, as an engineer, you've got to be very, very careful about. Right? Now, the other thing you will notice from these graphs is this one slopes downward, and this one slopes upward. So you would think, OK, this is a completely different uh, issue. But it's not. It's that's related with the fact that if you do, if you took Descartes's point of view, all right, then this is what you would get: the quality of motion of the price will be always positive. But then you can't really get any further because there's no bid price, there's no offer price, and there's no notion of how these two can meet and then cancel itself out. You know now. So what we need to do. Is, is be sure that we have positive prices and negative prices, okay? And we have to be very clear about those signs. Also, we have positive ones and negative ones, which imply these price changes. They have to be, is the price going up or is it going down, okay? This is a major issue. So all, this, this is also a positive mass, so never, make the mistake of thinking this is a negative mass. That's nonsense, OK? You got one of the axes running the wrong way, or both. No, one of them. Or both, yeah, one of them running the wrong way. 
or three of them running the wrong way. That's also possible because normally when there's a supply curve, this is quantity supplied, but if it's a demand curve, the quantity supply goes this way. They, they flip around this axis, but not that one, all right? So if you were to place these demand and supply graphs in an engineering context, and we'll, uh, we'll get a little bit more uh, precise about that, you will do, have to do something like this. You'll have to make a decision what's the positive side here, positive side there, and these are both negative, right? So this graph may end up you know, over there, and this one over there, all right? And the other thing you notice, this thing curves, right? And uh, this thing doesn't allow for any curvature. Mass is always constant, okay? So in the analog, you, you just have to disallow this. It has to go like this. They can say, ah, but this is what they think it is. Yeah, maybe, but somehow there must be other forces, you know? So this is a force moving it up, and that's what they're measuring, okay? So it's like, all right, I have, a, 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 I have this, you can't really see it, but I have a table, I have a mouse, I give it a whack so it gets a certain amount of momentum, but then it just reduces over time because of friction. Now, if I don't know Newton's laws and I don't know that it's friction that's doing it, then, then I may think the mass is being reduced and, and somehow or, or increased and somehow the thing is slowing down because it's getting more and more mass and it's maintaining momentum, right? Now, that's just not the case. You just left out a force, okay? So every time you see yourself groping for a demand line and you think, okay, it's gonna change, don't do it. You just miss the force, all right? That's not to say that in economics this is bad. It's just to say that if you're gonna apply these principles to uh, economic engineering principles, you can't do it. You just get stuck, all right? Mass is always constant, even in relativity where some of you have been taught maybe on the internet that it changes, it does not. Huh? Okay? So, this is Newton's definition. So he defines momentum by taking the, the definition of uh, Huygens. And uh, what we do is we go to this guy called Marshall, and he, he was the first one, I have his, uh, this slide actually here. This is from his book. He wrote a book in the 19th century, and this is his demand and supply. He's the first one who introduced this. So he puts there the price, and here the, uh, you have to read the book. It's all in a very old time uh, way, okay? So, So we'll take care of the definitions by saying, okay, we'll take Marshall's law of supply and demand and we'll match that onto Huygens' uh, uh, definition of momentum, okay? All right, so. Now, next one. Then move moves on to Escolium. And there he defines what he means by space and time, actually. And his definition of time is, uh, is being fixed later by, um, by uh, uh, Einstein, right? So for uh, Newton, what time was absolute, it turns out not to be, and the space is also fixed a little bit. But in principle, this, uh, the Newton's way of viewing at it is what we normally would use in uh, this department, okay? His laws will appear to be still right, independent of this. So it's just a question of defining what space is and uh, what time is. And um, that's what I want to do now in this slide. I want to tell you what's the space. So here's a space. So this is an X coordinate, this is a Y coordinate. And then a particle can move in that space. It doesn't have to be a particle, really. If you have a robot arm like this, what will be the space? So it will be this angle, and then maybe this angle, and you would have a configuration space. Or if you have some antenna that's going out, you would just measure the length of how much you extracted one from the other, okay? And this will be n dimensions, each dimension belonging to a, so this is a degree of freedom, and this is a degree of freedom, all right? And that's how we would model things. So you look at all the degrees of freedom, and then you just plot with a point, 
than where you are, right? So if this is Newton, he only looked at Euclidean space. So he says, I moved up so much, and I moved to the left so much, all right? Yeah? And you use, you, you use one coordinate system, which is also defended by this guy Descartes, and it's called the Cartesian coordinate frame. Right? So Newton actually didn't think of it that way. He thought more in vectors, you know? Uh, he said rectilinear motion in a particular direction, he would talk about. He didn't use all these coordinates. That uh, came all later when they did uh, all this coordinate dependent stuff. But anyway, we can, this is how we view it, all right? What do you do in economics? What are the degrees of freedom for economics? Okay. Well, what they correspond with are the various, and we will call them goods or commodities that you're using. So these could be apples, and these could be barrels of oil. Huh? I don't know, whatever you feel like. So we think of the space as spanned by all the, ver all the commodities we're trading. Now, why do I use the word commodity and not goods? The word commodity implies that the goods are fungible. That's the term. It means you can exchange one for the other. So you can just say, I got 50, uh, 50 barrels of oil, and it's all the same. So you can just keep adding it up. So you can just plot it here on this uh, dimension. So you need that notion of fungibility, all right? And it also means that they are not distinguishable from one another, only from other commodities. And those are fungible as well, so they can be exchanged. So they have their own coordinate axis. Now, in general, the way economists talk about goods is not as a fungible thing. So if you have 50 paintings, you have 50 great things, but they're all different. One is by Rembrandt, the other one is by your grandmother, you know, and uh, they're just not the same. Huh? Okay. So the notion of a commodity is the precise way for economists saying that all he needs to do is just keep track of how much of this has been bought or sold or stored or dissipated or depleted or whatever. Okay. Huh? And that's why these axes are the commodities, and this is a two commodity huh? economy. What economists do is uh, they plot this in something called an Edgeworth box. So here you see they've got two players, Abby and Octavio. This is Octavio, this is Abby, and uh, they have a commodity X and commodity Y. And you can see here again, and, and this is done by a guy called Ed Edgeworth. So this would correspond with this space, except they have two axes, whereas we have only one. Now, why do they do that? The way they view uh, this is there is a certain endowment, they will call it, huh, of this commodity. That's the total amount. We typically don't do that. There is, of course, some total amount of space available between these two walls, but we assume this is infinite, okay? Well, that doesn't matter. That's not essential. But why do they do that? The problem is they don't want to use vectors. They don't want to use negative numbers, right? That's a vector in one dimension, a negative positive number. So they think of the amount of commodity X, say apples or barrels of oil, that this, this Abbey person has no, none of either here and all of either there and inversely, okay? So this is the zero point for this person, and this is the zero stock for that person, okay? Then they start trading and they start exchanging, and as Octavio gives commodity X and Y to Abby, you'll see that they walk, can walk along this line going from point to point, and this here is called the contract curve. All right, so they make these contracts with each other, they exchange. Huh? There's not necessarily money yet involved here. It's just a, how, uh, you're just measuring how much of each uh, they are handing over to each other, okay, and integrating that out. All right? So this will be here our contract curve, and you will be, how would we do it? Well, we would take some arbitrary point of zero here, 
we will measure that as a negative and that as a positive, and here a combination of negatives and positives. And then we'll look at the movement as how these do interactions as a velocity along this curve, okay? And that velocity is a tangent vector, which is equal to Q1 dot and Q2 dot, okay? So, in my opinion, this cleans up a lot of stuff, all right? If you got to oh, some article describing these entrance boxes, the articles are long, like all, huh? and you have to have these two coordinate systems, and you're always jumping from one coordinate system to another. Descartes' idea, just putting one in there, having negatives and positives, and then having directions, that's the right one, okay? Now you can see another idea here is that they're really, now, the space is really much bigger if you want to do dynamics, you see? Because as an economist, you may think that if you just know where you are, you know, uh, you know the state. But that's not really true. You also got to tell me how you're going to be traveling along that thing. So the real state is a combination of these two vectors. Right? So I tell you where I am and how fast I'm going. So I tell you how much I have already bought and sold and how much I'm currently buying and selling. All right? Now this space is what we call the state space. So this And this space where you only have positions is what we call co configuration space. All right? So, that's the terminology. Now, well, actually, economists don't really have a notion of a vectorial quantity or a tangent to a line. They don't do very little calculus, you know? You don't see any geometry either. They'll focus on what the ultimate equilibrium point is, and then they'll have lines like this saying that implying that it's equilibrium. So quite a different approach, okay? And of course, you don't need a tangent space. You don't need a velocity space if you're just talking about equilibrium because you're not describing how fast things are going, all right? But anyway, there is a... So what do you do when your model thinks, well, the rule is always first get into the right space, right? So if you have a robot arm or an antenna or a rigid body, first thing you do is to figure out what are the possible configurations the body can have. So if it's a rigid body, you have three position coordinates and three angles that the thing can have, all right? There you are, six dimensional. If you have an uh, articulated arm of, with six degrees of freedom, boing, 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 six positions, and then uh, you just keep track of six velocities to go along with them if you feel like doing that in your state space, okay? And that's the same thing here. So when you start doing your modeling, this don't, doesn't have to be two commodities, it can be one or, or, or n, but first line up your space correctly, because then you can do uh, uh, mechanics, all right? And then the motion in that space, that is precisely this, uh, contract curve. Then what happens is, and this is a little bit of a preview, you're going to miss some stuff. You can't model everything, so there may be some transportation costs or some, some person may have bought uh, this pencil and you don't want to like, uh, keep track of it. And that you all throw together in another coordinate, hey, and, uh, that you uh, call entropy, but we'll get to that later. But think first, figure out the things that you want to you want to track and draw up your space. Okay, that's what Newton did too. And after he established what momentum is and uh, space is, he started uh, formulating his laws. So we'll do the same thing, work. And he starts with, uh, unsurprisingly, his first law. And um, 
You normally learn this in the form like a body at rest uh, goes at a constant speed in the same direction or something like that, okay? Now, what does that have to do with economics? Now, what Newton is really doing here, he's borrowing an idea from uh, Galileo, and it's the idea of inertia. <coughs> and um, if you leave an inertial body alone, this is what Newton would call the sta uh, a condition of rest. So you're just going, I'm just standing here, the earth is spinning, I'm spinning along with it, I'm at rest, I don't feel any forces acting on me, okay? And this first law defines this idea of rest, but it does a little bit more, it also allows you, it's an operational definition, it allows you to check whether there you are at rest, okay? So how can you check that? Okay, see the problem with Newton's law is that all seems circular unless, unless you see some of these subtleties, okay? So how would I know that I'm at rest? Well, Newton's answer is that you are no forces acting upon you, all right? So how do I know they have no forces acting on me? Well, I'm in rectilinear motion, and I feel nothing, and everything that goes along with me is doing the same thing. So if I'm at rest, and I take my keys out of my pocket, and I let them drop, then they better drop straight down and don't, don't fly backwards, because I'm not at rest then, and I should feel a force if they fly backwards, then I should feel a force in my back pushing me forward, an acceleration force, and inversely, okay? So, Newton, I, he associates the idea of rest with two things. First, the existence of something that's called an inertial reference frame. So you say, okay, how do I check what I'm at rest? So first of all, you get yourself an inertial reference frame. And then you check whether there are no, no forces acting on you, or at, and as a result, you'll see that you'll go in a rectilinear motion, he says, so you'll go at some constant velocity in this inertial reference frame. Then you know you're at rest, right? Now, there's a couple of consequences from this, and one of the consequences was the, also formulated by Galileo, was the principle of relativity. Relativity. So, we all think of the principle of relativity as, come, uh, as formulated by Einstein, but that's not true. Einstein got it from Galileo. And Galileo, he, he realized that if you took, I mean, if you, if you think of this, what this is requiring, what it means is, that you can only figure out how fast you're going with respect to a particular inertial reference frame. So there's no way to determine by yourself without this inertial reference frame and this concept of rest, how fast you're going. So if you're standing in a train, Galileo took a boat. There were no trains at that time. So he imagines a boat and he has flies in the room, in the captain's room, and he has the captain himself. It's a really nice description. He says those flies, that boat may be going at a whipping speed or maybe anchored to the shore, but those flies will have no idea, okay? There's nothing they can figure out from, their, from the closed space of how fast they're going, okay? If they look outside, they can see the shoreline or they can see another ship, and they can look at the difference in these velocities, but they'll never know that there is some absolute velocity at which everybody's going. It's, it's impossible, okay? So what, what Galileo said here, what Newton took, is that the only thing you can look at is like price differences. Let me turn that around. Uh, uh, velocity differences, all right? That's the only thing you can measure, all right? These are two principles that are uh, are implied by his first law. It's a little bit uh, subtle like this. 
Now, without getting too, too uh, far into it, let's say what it has to do with economics. So, what is motion, what is velocity? That's how a quantity demanded, okay? So let's go ahead and, 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 and look at that. Um, so I have here two, uh, two masses. First is the wall, it's going at some speed V star. And uh, then I have some other mass, like that. And I flipped around some of the signs, so this thing is going down. So this is a demand curve, and this is a supply curve. So this is a flyer, and this is a demander, all right? So here I plot them. Now, what's the characteristic of this wall? It, it, you can't change the velocity. It's attached to the Earth and everything. It's a huge mass. So that thing is just standing still. So, so no matter how hard you push at it, and you, you try to change the momentum, nothing is going to happen. So this wall here corresponds to this perfectly inelastic uh, supply line. So the wall will always deliver you the same velocity, no matter what, how hard you kick at it, all right, and how much momentum you pour in it. Similarly, this supplier will always deliver you this amount of the goods, independent of what price you do, all right? So this, this wall here, this becomes your inertial reference frame. And you can say, well, that's what I'm going to call zero velocity. Or you can call it also 20. I don't care. Huh? Well, the choice of when the velocity is zero is to some degree arbitrary in uh, Newton's system. All right? And Newton had a really tough time with this because if you read him, he's going on and on because he's trying to find the one absolute inertial reference frame because he has an idea there must be one. That's called absolute space. And he can't find it anywhere because he knows the Earth is moving with respect to the sun and the sun is moving with respect to the solar system. So he finally kind of throws his hands up in the air and he says he defines an inertial reference frame as being the thing attached to all the stars in the entire universe and it's just there, okay? Now that is okay, but it, what I think we, our position, modern position will be, look, it doesn't matter. You can take anything you like. You just have to imagine it as a reference, okay? And I like to do the same in economics. So what is this reference velocity that you need to imagine what everything does? Well, you can think it's the market. There's a market for apples, and I'm a small player, and I go to this market, and I... I can like jack up my price up and down, and the market's not going to do anything. It's going to give me as many apples as I want. You know, I'm just not impacting the oil market or the apple market. You know, sure. But what happens then if there's no market, or maybe it's, uh, or if the market is really small? Uh, maybe it's the Federal Reserve is just like pumping, or the government is just buying or selling always enough money or whatever they do. You know, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. Every time you can come up with your own wall, and you'll find out there never is really a big wall. There's always somebody bigger, all right? Huh? And uh, that's the position I'd like to take also, like the modern position that it's, the statement is that there exists such things as inertial reference frame, such that the condition of rest is characterized by feeling no forces when you're in rectilinear motion. This is if you're in motion going at the same rate at the same time. So in your entrance box, you're just buying the same commodities. This pen is falling apart. Huh? Hold on. I'll take the other one. I'm just gesticulating too wildly, and now my pen fell up, and the other one is gone. Is there another one? No, let's just use this one then. And then, what you do, if you want to really figure out what the demand is, then all you do is look at that difference from here to there, and that's the, the flow, all right? And that's what you're gonna put in your uh, 
uh, engineering uh, substitution for the uh, velocity. All right? So now we're no, no, no longer looking at demand, but excess. That's right. Excess over somebody else. Exactly. The excess over the supply? Yeah. Yeah. And then you take some standard supplier, you can turn it all around. Supply uh, with respect to an, a, a standard demander, right? All consumers together is the demand, and you're one supplier, and you're looking how much you're applying huh? in shortage or, huh? So rather than demand, huh? you're looking at the excess demand. But it's always over something, right? And it's like us saying, what's the velocity? It's five meters per second faster than, you know, something else, the observer, okay? We typically take the lab, lab, laboratory frame as an inertial frame, and then we do an experiment, and we say, the car is going at this much with respect to the road. But if the car is driving on a ship and the ship is always going, then we have to say that this velocity is with respect to the ship, which is going at a velocity with respect to, you know, eh? all right? Okay, that's right. Now, if you look at these, most of these economic demand and supply lines, you know, you, they draw something like this, but nobody says where the zero is. They could have drawn it here and there, right? Huh? They, they, they let it just float around a little bit, you know? The zero really has no meaning for them, and that's how it should be, right? That's just your choice of inertial reference frame. That's right. So in economic engineering, don't look at absolute demand. Look at excess, uh, excesses, you know, oversupply or shortage. So if the excess demand is positive, they can call that uh, yeah, oversupply or a shortage, actually, from the perspective huh? or an oversupply. That's the principle of relativity. Now, what is the first law says that when you're in, you can measure uh, demand in terms of excess demand, just with respect to some standard that you choose, right? So, and if you keep going at a constant rate, so here is a demander and he's going at this rate, for instance, eh, or this one, and he keeps doing it, then he is in rest, okay? Now, this is what we would call uh, economic or Marshallian equilibrium. So this is this crossing of a supply and demand curve. So when this is zero, they call that equilibrium. But they could have put another reference here, and then it would be minus five is the equilibrium. All right? Um, OK. Is, is there then a reason why we wouldn't uh, merge the, the vertical price axis with one of the uh, purposes, either excess, uh, either demand or supply, put equilibrium at zero, and then just make one of the yeah. purposes disappear. Because if we're only measuring with respect to... Yeah, sure. Line. Yeah, that's like making this thing disappear, right? I mean, you just look at this. Uh, but not really there, then you're measuring from the wall, because... No, no, the wall is another, the wall is another eye element, it's another mass, that's this one. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Normally you have two masses, yeah. and you say, well, one of the masses becomes the wall, they're starting as weighted from yeah. that eye element. Yeah, that's what you do. That's what you do here. You can do this. You can say, well, I have two masses here, another one, as another velocity, and I'm sitting on this mass here, and I'm looking at that one, and now I measure this difference, okay? As long as you're going with a constant speed, that's not going to be a problem. You're also in an inertial reference frame. The problem is that if this guy hits you a little bit, you know, you get jerked around, and then the laws of motion won't be valid anymore. You won't be arrest. You understand? Huh? Okay. So you can do that. So, it, but, you know, if you do it this way, you'll put a spring here, and then it gets really complicated, you know? So you'll have this, this, and then 
You know, now what is this velocity with respect to this? So you're looking at this difference of these velocities. You wouldn't do that that way. You know, you would find this, this velocity with respect to the wall, that one with respect to the wall, and then sort it out, right? But there's no reason why you couldn't do that. I mean, you can, you know, you know like, if you have a robot arm, huh? so what do you have? You have one angle, and then you have a, another angle, right? Okay. Well, I don't you could do it with respect to the other one, huh? Yes, sorry. That's what you typically do, right? You call this V is zero, right? That's what I wrote down, right? Yeah, okay, but why, what, what would be the purpose of doing it in any other way if uh, this is what we want? Well, it may, it, may be, it may be that you're looking at relative motion. So you're standing, on the, you're standing on the shore and you have a guy running on a ship. You know, I mean, it all depends on your application, okay? Huh? And, and, and now I'm asking, what could be an uh, application in economics uh, where we do not want to merge this uh, demand or... Well, the, the same one. You have a huge market, that's the, the volume going through. Then you are transacting within that market with somebody else, and you want to look at what you're doing among each other, independent of the market, you know? I mean, and the market want to look at your interaction. I mean, it, 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 there's nothing fundamental going on here. The only thing that's fundamental is that quantity demanded is a relative notion. That's the principle of relativity. Now, why you would do this or that, these are all practical matters, okay? We're trying to focus here on the theory, right? The law. This is what the law states. How you, as an engineer, use that law to model something is another matter. All right? Huh? You see? And I want you to separate. That's important to separate in your head. All right? So that's why I kind of don't want to get bogged down on this discussion, because it's just not germane to the point. The point is, every quantity demanded is relative to some other one, right? Whether you agreed with everybody to choose one as zero and be done with it or didn't, you know, you got, got to keep that in your mind. All right? Okay? That's the importance. So you see, what I've done here is I showed you how these differences and you, you can do that here too, and you gotta be careful with the sign here, and uh, those are all practical matters, right? What I wanna do, do, show you here is that the first law, which gives you this notion of rest, will correspond to economics as a notion of equilibrium and demand and supply. So in the, when demand and supply are in equilibrium, you know, you, the, the, the volume on the market is just a particular thing, it's not changing, all right? Eh? And we would say at that moment, are, there are no economic forces acting on it, right? Or another way is that the wants of the supplier are bound by the wants of the demander, because a want is a force, okay? And the net want is zero. So nobody's jacking up the price or lowering it, okay? That's Newton's idea of rest, okay? So what's happening? The two masses are moving at the same speed, you know, and uh, they just, this is a supply, that's a demander, right, and done. There's nothing more to do. Huh? They're in equilibrium. Okay? Let's move on. The second law. Now, this is the biggie. All right? So, we got a little delayed here, so I'll finish this off uh, next week, but I do want to get into this. Okay? So, in the second law, Newton says really only one thing. He says, he actually says, a change in, so he took this idea of momentum 
from Descartes, and he says, well, that's fine, but how do I change this? The change in momentum, I have to apply a force over some period of time, and this is sometimes called the impulse of the force, all right, over that small period. Now, this is actually the brilliant part, because here, this is a definition. So before Newton, you're going like, well, a force, and there's a push and a pull, and now it's equal because uh, we're pulling these ropes or something. After him, you say, well, how, much, how, is, how big is this force? Well, let's take a mass, and let's look at how much it changes the momentum, and then, then I know. Right? And you know what the momentum is, it's just um, times V, right? So if I plug that in, I know that force is the time derivative of M times V. Now, if I keep the mass constant, then this is F, F is M times A, all right? This is not what Newton said, of course. Newton said this, Descartes said P is M times V, you plug it in, you keep the mass constant, you get this, all right? This thing is actually wrong in the relativity, but this thing is not. Huh? So to say that Einstein proved Newton wrong and that his second law is wrong, that's not true. His notion of space was off, but not the laws. The laws are correct. Now, this is the big, 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 big move we make in economic engineering. How do we define an economic force? We can talk about, I want this, and you want that, and now I want to sell this as much as you want to buy, and then we're in equilibrium, you know, and I don't want to part with it, neither do I, so everything is okay. But, this is like pulling ropes, you know? Huh? You can't observe this really, except if it's in equilibrium. Well, it's not in equilibrium. Yeah, then we, the thing is just, yeah, out of equilibrium. Newton's idea gives us also the key to measuring how things, when it's not the forces are not in equilibrium, what will happen. And what's going to happen is the price will move. So it really, there's something called the price mechanism, and I love the way it's called the mechanism, because the price mechanism is, is exactly Newton's second law. It tells you the mechanism at which the price will move. All right? So something is, body's going to want something more than somebody else. If you go and buy Hagelslag at the Albert Heijn, you want that more than the Albert Heijn wants to keep it. Okay? So you, you jack up that price a little bit, and they'll let it go. Huh? All right? Now, let's go back to the uh, supply line uh, of uh, economists. They talk about something called a movement along the demand curve. I said supply line, this is a demand curve, all right? So here is your quality demanded, they'll call it Q. You know, so this is whatever you're buying, apples, here's the price. And here are the different points at which your price is this, here's your price that, with a different quality demanded, 75, all right? Apparently, they have it with respect to some zero that they took themselves, okay? And uh, they're a little bit sloppy about the thing, but this is okay, okay? Then they say, well, what can happen with this price? Now, either the price goes up or it goes down. When it goes up, they call it a contraction along the... There's all these are movements along the demand curve. This they call a contraction, and this an extension. So they have the idea that demand, which is the flow, gets extended, you know, so it gets bigger. So the velocity goes up, and the rate at which this goes, that must be given by the error, but the arrow is the change in the quantity demanded over time, and that's the acceleration. So the acceleration is the extension, and the negative would be the contraction, or the other way around, right? You can take positive whatever you feel like, eh? all right? And what is then the, the force? Well, if this is the acceleration, I, I, I should put the arrow that way, then this should be the change in price, and this should be the force of demand. And this thing is often called the force of demand. Is it? No, they talk about it in a very intuitive way. What have we done here? We've made it precise. Thanks to, with a little help from our friend, Isaac, okay? Right? 
This is the big step, all right? You use Newton's idea of a motive force for a mass, and you change the wants or desires or needs of people to be calibrated in the same way. So the idea is, I can see what price you are willing to pay and how much you're willing to bid more. Then I know how your wants are. You don't turn it around, ask him what his wants are, and then try to deduce what the prices are. Because he can say anything he likes. But he can't deny that he's, you know, that he is actually spending that money, okay? Huh? Cash, it will tell you everything. Huh? Don't, you know, don't talk to talk, but you gotta walk the walk, right? You gotta really show, you know, put your mouth where your money is, that's an expression. And this is the way we define the, the economic force. You put your mouth where your money is. So this is what they really do, okay? They put the money in the price movement, okay? So here I uh, made some graphs, so you'll see that the way I chose the prices was the excess demand is, is a negative thing, then I can make the price positive, you see, so if this is negative, then the price will go up, and then I can plot this P dot and uh, the flow uh, along here, and I can here write, this is just F is N times A, right, huh? or if you use E for the effort. Um, yeah. It's just, these, uh, these two graphs are exactly what I just meant in the previous slide. Exactly. Uh, but now comes the confusion part, because here you uh, highlighted the uh, surplus. Yeah. Uh, and for the surplus, uh, it's always measured from the, from the price axis, not integrated. But if you share it, and measure from the equilibrium point, the surplus is something different. Yeah. This, this graph, as uh, the, the normal way they present it, can you all see this? Where here in your graph, the surplus would be up here, during the demand down, so it coincides with the price axis, and here they put the side. All right, so, so, so listen, Joris, we're at the end of the, 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 the talk. So uh, what I want to do is make only one remark about this and then uh, deal with this later because our hour is up. But let me say this. this, this unfortunately, this had the surplus in only because I made that picture like that. I didn't want to talk about that yet, all right? Huh? Just wanted to focus on this. But let me make the remark that if velocity is a relative concept, then so is kinetic energy. So suppose you have a mass and it's moving at a particular velocity, right? What is the kinetic energy? It's a half mv squared, right? <laughs> you're, you're done, right? But now suppose, how are you measuring this velocity? Suppose you're standing on the Earth here, right? And this is also moving with velocity v, all right? Then what is the kinetic energy? Well, it's zero. But now here's another guy standing on something standing still, you know, huh? and now it's all of a sudden a big number. Okay? This was somebody standing on the moon, the, 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 the moon, I actually have a lot of kinetic energy, but my neighbor doesn't think I have anything because I'm just standing still, all right? So when you start doing this stuff, be careful because velocity is relative. And the same is with demand. You've got to say, with respect to who, you have surplus. Surplus is not something you have absolutely, like kinetic energy. It's always respect to a counterparty, all right? If this counterparty may be a big fat trader or a market, you know, and then it's indeed, uh, you know, huh? okay? You've got to see that. Kinetic energy is not an absolute quantity, it's relative. You can make it disappear uh, if you start moving along with the, with the, with the mass, all right? Huh? Okay? And so it is with surplus, except with surplus it's more clear. What will be the surplus? 
If I'm a farmer from 10,000 BC and I have all this surplus and I start to trade with the guy next door who's also a farmer who has the same surplus, there's no surplus among us, you know? So I think I got a lot of stuff and I go to this market where all these other farmers are and nobody's interested. But now I have somebody who's got nothing to, to eat, but he's built all these nice clothes or pots and pans. In a, in a huge surplus, okay? All right? Because the velocity differences are so enormous, you can generate all this trade, okay? Okay? All right, so I went five minutes over time, but and I didn't achieve what I wanted to do, but that's no, no huh? we'll uh, talk about, this is where I wanted to talk about surplus, but that's okay. Uh, we'll finish that off next week. And now I'd like to let you go, and uh, I have to go to another meeting as well. So, and then, oh yeah, on Thursday, we'll have, a, we'll have a meeting that we know student speakers. I will speak and I will give a, a presentation on how to write your midterm report and a final report and that kind of stuff, okay? But you'll hear about that. In the meantime, I'll see you uh, Thursday. All right, thank you, Mr.